Hi friends, this is Dr. Ralph Wilson with the Jesus Walk Bible Study Series. We're studying Behold the Lamb of God. This is Lesson 4, the Passover Lamb whom we partake, based on 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Let me read that passage for you. The Apostle Paul writes, Get rid of the old yeast, that you may be a new batch, without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you, Jesus Christ, have been sacrificed as our Passover lamb. Teach us what that means. Help us to understand you more fully as we prepare for Easter and Passover time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul calls Christ our Passover lamb, echoing the early church's belief that Christ was a fulfillment of the Passover or Paschal lamb from Hebrew Pesach or Passover. As I study the New Testament, I am becoming more and more convinced that Jesus too saw himself in this role and implies as much in his words at the Last Supper, which it turns out were shared in the context of an actual Passover meal. Let's explore this aspect of Christ's ministry of atonement as the Passover lamb. To do this, we need to go back 13 or 14 centuries before Christ to the people of Israel when they were slaves in Egypt. You know the story. As God begins to deliver Israel from Egypt, he sends Moses to Pharaoh with the demand, let my people go. Pharaoh refuses. Following each refusal, God sends plagues of increasing severity upon Egypt, culminating with God's decree that each firstborn son in Egypt would be slain. But when Moses declares God's words to Pharaoh, Pharaoh refuses to believe them. To protect from this plague the Israelites who lived in Egypt, God instructs Moses that each household should select a yearling male lamb and slaughter it at dusk on the 14th day of Abib, the Hebrew month that corresponds with March or April. Exodus 12, 7. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. Then during the night, the angel of death passes through Egypt, slaying the firstborn of both men and animals to bring judgment on Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. Exodus 12:13 reads, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Verse 23, When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. The Hebrew verb used in these verses is pasak, and while there are several theories about the meaning of this verb, two seem most plausible. The traditional etymology is the meaning to pass over, that is, the merciful passing over of a destructive power. Some interpret pasak as meaning to defend, protect, that is, the Lord will protectively cover the houses of the Israelites, will not allow the destroyer to enter. In either case, the blood is a sign to the Lord that the house that bears it should be exempted from the judgment on the firstborn. Well, just what kind of sacrifice is this initial paschal lamb offered at Exodus? It is not like the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement, or one of the morning or evening offerings. Most of these offerings were to atone for sin in some sense, while the commemorative sacrifice of Passover lambs in the temple each year was not considered an atonement for sin. But what was the significance of the initial sacrifice of Passover lambs at the first Passover? Five offerings were performed in the tabernacle and later in the temple. Of these, Old Testament scholar Richard Averbeck observes that the sacrifice of the Passover lamb bears some resemblance to the peace or fellowship offering. In this type of offering, a representative piece of meat is offered before the Lord and to the priests. 
The rest is eaten by the offerer and his family as a kind of celebration meal, similar to the celebration meal of the Passover. Averbeck also notes similarities between the original Passover act of placing blood on the doorpost and lintel and the ordination of priests, where blood is placed on the priest's ear, right thumb, and right big toe as an act of consecration. He sees the initial Passover offering as a consecration or setting apart of the people within each household who partook of the sacrifice. Israel's sin doesn't seem to be in the forefront. Rather, the lamb seems to be kind of a substitute or interposition for the firstborn males and animals in the household. However, there may be some kind of expiation or purification present since hyssop is used to smear the blood. Elsewhere, hyssop is associated with expiation and purification. In addition, some rabbinical writings refer to the redemptive effects of the blood of the Passover lamb. Well, we come to discussion question one. You know how this works. Uh, I'll read the question and then pause the DVD and discuss it in your group. And when you've finished, then resume the DVD. From Exodus 12, in what way did the lambs on the first Passover protect the families of God's people? What was the primary point of comparison between the first Passover lambs and what Christ did for us as our Passover lamb. Pause the DVD now and discuss it, and then resume when you finish your discussion. Jews were instructed to partake of the Passover annually to celebrate and commemorate God's redeeming them from slavery in Egypt. By Jesus' day, Passover was to be celebrated only within the precincts of Jerusalem. So the city was jam-packed with pilgrims during this season. There is some question whether the Last Supper Jesus held with his disciples was a Passover meal or a special meal the day before Passover. Synoptic Gospels are pretty clear that the Last Supper was a Passover meal, but the chronology of John's Gospel seems to indicate that Jesus was crucified just before Passover began. Well, these can probably be harmonized by assuming use of different calendars among the Jews. However, I'm convinced that the Last Supper was indeed held on Passover as part of the Passover meal. Let's look at some of the elements of the Passover meal as it might have been held in Jesus' day. Each element of the meal was blessed and then commented on, called the Haggadah, by the head of the household, in this case, Jesus. Unleavened bread was a symbol of past misery and the speed with which the Israelites had to pack and leave before the bread had risen, Exodus 12, 34. Bitter herbs represented the bitterness of slavery, Exodus 12, 8. Fruit puree was reminiscent of the clay the Israelites used to make bricks in their captivity as slaves in Egypt. And the Passover lamb was a reminder of God's merciful passing over. This was a very special meal, since neither wine nor meat were common as everyday fare. Here is a reconstruction of the meal based on the research of New Testament scholar Joachim Jeremias. First, the preliminary course. There was the blessing of the festival day, Kedush, spoken over the first cup of wine. Then a preliminary dish of green herbs, bitter herbs, and fruit sauce was served. And then finally, the meal proper was served, but they didn't yet eat it. And they mixed the second cup of wine. Next, number two, was the Passover liturgy itself. The head of the family says the Passover narrative, the Haggadah. Then the group sings Psalm 113, called the Little Hallel and there is the drinking of the second cup of wine. Well, this is followed by the third part, the main meal. A blessing is spoken over the bread by the head of the family who broke it and distributed it to those who were at the table. Here is where Jesus would have blessed the bread, broken it, and distributed it to his disciples. Here, he forever made the bread special and set it apart with these unique words. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Then there was the eating the meal of lamb, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. And then a blessing spoken over the third cup of wine called the cup of blessing in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Here, before the concluding hymn, that is the great Hallel, Jesus would have blessed the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Then the fourth part, the conclusion of the meal, the group would sing together Psalms 114 to 118, uh, called the Great Hallel, recalling the words in Matthew 26, 30, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then finally, the blessing spoken over the fourth cup of wine. If this outline of the Passover meal at the Last Supper is accurate, then Jesus' words about the bread being his body and the cup being his blood are immediately adjacent to the eating of the Passover lamb. I can't escape the conclusion that Jesus' words were interpreted by his disciples and probably intended by Jesus to be understood in relation to the Passover and the Passover lamb. Clearly, the early church thought of Jesus as the Passover or Paschal lamb that had been sacrificed, as our theme verse, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, indicates. Perhaps the analogy is, Jesus interposes himself to redeem his people from their bondage to sin, just as the Passover lamb was interposed to redeem the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. Well, I'd like us now to pause for discussion question two. Compare the annual Jewish Passover celebration meal in Jesus' day with the Christian celebration of the Lord's Supper. What are the similarities you see? What are the differences? Pause the DVD now and then resume when you're finished discussing. It's pretty clear that what we call Jesus' words of institution use clear sacrificial language. Let me read Matthew 26, verses 26 to 28. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. While I can't be exhaustive, let's briefly examine Matthew's account. Most striking to me in this passage are Jesus' words, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. One, Jesus associates the red wine with his own blood and then asks the disciples to drink it. This would be startling to anyone, but especially to Jews who were prohibited from drinking blood. In John 6, 53-57, such offensive words caused some disciples to leave Jesus and no longer follow him. Coupled with Jesus asking the disciples to eat bread that he identified with his body, we have a remarkable and powerful image. Jesus is asking his disciples to feed on him, John 6, 57, and unite themselves to him and to his death using a very intimate and powerful figure. How could the disciples forget such a vivid idea? They couldn't. Jesus intended that they remember. Two, Jesus identifies his blood with the institution of a new covenant. Though the original manuscripts of Matthew's gospel may have omitted the word new, the concept of a new covenant was surely in his mind. The concept of the blood of the covenant is found in Exodus 27, verses 7 and 8, where blood is sprinkled over the people of Israel when they agree to the original covenant they were making with Yahweh at the foot of Mount Sinai. But the prophet Jeremiah heralded the coming of the new covenant of forgiveness of sins, replacing the Mosaic covenant. Let me read from 
Jeremiah 31, starting with verse 31. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. They will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Let's pause now for discussion question three. Why should the words, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, fill us with sorrow? Why should these words fill us with joy? Pause the DVD now and discuss it, and then resume when you're finished. Number three, Jesus links his death with the suffering servant's sacrifice for the sins of many. As we mentioned in lesson two of this series, the phrase, for many, points back to Isaiah 53, verses 11 and 12, where the servant bore the sin of many. Jesus uses the phrase, poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sin. To pour out blood in order to obtain forgiveness for another is clearly the concept of a blood sacrifice. In our day, some who are offended by this concept seek to reinterpret the meaning of the Lord's Supper. But it's pretty hard to hide the truth that Jesus intended it to remember his death as a sacrifice for sins. Well, discussion question four. Why is it so important to forgive those who have offended us before partaking of the Lord's Supper? In what sense are the Lord's Supper and unforgiveness incompatible? In discussing this, I'd like you to consider several verses. Matthew 26, 28, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven, 27, Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, and 5, 23 and 24, and finally, James 5, 16. Pause the DVD now and discuss it, and then resume when you finish your discussion. Number four, Jesus looks forward to the ultimate Passover in the kingdom of God. Matthew 26, 29, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Here, Jesus is referring to the great banquet alluded to in both the Old and New Testaments. The Jews of Jesus' day saw this as a final or eschatological Passover celebration with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the other patriarchs and prophets. So pause now for discussion question five. In what way does each celebration of the Lord's Supper anticipate a future Passover meal? And in your discussion, consider these verses, Matthew 26, 29, Luke 13, 28 to 29, 14, 15, 22, 30, Revelation 19, 9, and 1 Corinthians 11, 26. Pause the DVD now and then turn it on when you finish the discussion. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And in the Lord's Supper, we are invited to partake not only of the sacrifice, but to celebrate both our redemption through Christ's atonement and his coming again. The next time you have the privilege of partaking of the Lord's Supper, remember and be thankful. Just as the Passover lamb was interposed to redeem the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, so Jesus interposes himself to redeem his people from their bondage to sin. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Father, thank you for the rich imagery of Christ as our Passover Lamb. Thank you for his willingness to be sacrificed on our behalf. Thank you for the comfort and hope that we find in the Lord's Supper. 
and thank you for the expectation we have of the final banquet with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God richly bless you.